an incredible honor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. And before you speak, I'm going to... What is that? I'm going to do something. Thank you. Before I give Jan this beautiful award, I want to present her these amazing flowers from the Junior League of Dallas. Oh, yay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> we do everything big in Texas, right? <laughs> Is this great or what? Thank you so much. I'm lay a thank down. you. Thanks, guys. Oh, <laughs> trying to. It's a beautiful award. We're going to get out here a little bit further. Yeah, we don't want to get too far because we don't want to drop it. Just in case it does. <laughs> so wouldn't that be bad? It's going to tie up the fence here. Okay. And we'll let it go. Is anybody too on top? Wow. I don't know about you. I feel like I've just heard my eulogy. I just had no idea this many people would be at my funeral. So thank you all for coming. Wow, that was great. Oh, wow, I'm just almost speechless, almost. My guys from Dallas know that that's never the case. You all, I have this theory about junior league members, that there are major leaguers and that there are minor leaguers. For me, um, I was definitely in the minor leagues, although I think today I may have been traded up to the major leagues. I don't know. Uh, it started for me in 1988 when I had what I fondly referred to as placement from hell. It was actually up there. I don't know if you guys spotted it. But as minor leaguers typically do, once we finish one placement, we start looking for the easy way out. And so I had read every volunteer opportunity possible to find the easy way out. And it was there. I found it. And I was in such a hurry to get up to the league office that day uh, so that I could grab that placement before my girlfriends did, before they found out. But I, the, this is a true story, by the way. I had broken one of my little Junior League of Dallas acrylic nails. And my heart's in the right place, right? I want to do good things in the community, but I need my nails to look right while I'm doing it. So on the way, <laughs> on the way to sign up for this placement, I actually whipped into a nail salon there on Lover's Lane, and there it was. There was a magazine that jumped up and hit me in the face, and it said, every 12 seconds in this country a woman is battered every 12 seconds, that one out of every four of us will know family violence. Some One out of every four of us will be beaten by someone he t who tells her that it is her fault, by someone he tell who tells her he loves her, and by someone who tells the rest of us that it is none of our business. Man, I remember thinking, not to anybody who looks like me, not to anybody that I know or anybody who lives near me. I read the rest of the article. It was about a woman. She was a lawyer, and he was a dentist, I think, both professionals. And it went on to say how he beat her with a tire tool because dinner was late. And I was horrified. I was stunned. I did get my nail fixed, but I tell you, by the time I got to the league office, ladies, I opened that brochure back up into violence intervention, and I shut my eyes, and I put my finger down on Genesis Women's Shelter. I'd never even heard of Genesis Women's Shelter, but there it was, and there I said I, I needed to be, and that's where I went. And again, I was stunned. I thought women at Genesis would look differently than I do. I thought their children would not look like mine. Uh, what I found was ladies battered women look like you and look like me. In fact, because because of the sheer numbers of women in this room, some of you already know what, I, what it is I'm talking about. I honestly did not know that men beat their wives. I did not know that men and women had sex with children and that, they, and that they grew up to look just like us. What I really did not know was the opportunity that had been given to me by the Junior League of Dallas, and that opportunity was to make a difference. So, long story a little bit longer, from the back row to project chair to board member to executive director, the Dallas League actually now even invites me to come and address the provisionals. Several of your leagues have invited me to come and tell the story. And look at me now, from the back row to the Mary Harriman Award. That is, <laughs> that is pretty incredible.
ladies, I got to tell you, I look at that list of past recipients. I look around this room and I see women of leadership and women of achievement. But I am a firm believer that if we are to lead and achieve, then we must. We must remove roadblocks that keep other women from leading and achieving. Roadblocks like poverty and lack of education and unjust laws and poor choices and poor health and the violence that is perpetrated against us. Ladies, I feel so strongly that homeland security must mean more than safety against terrorism on foreign soil or against our homeland. <laughs> homeland security, ladies, must also mean the end of terrorism against us in our own homes because until women can think freely and speak freely and move freely in their own homes and on the streets, then we truly do not have liberty nor justice for all. I do believe a day will come. I do believe a day will come when we can end hunger and suffering in our communities. And we are close enough to those goals to see them, but far enough away to know that we cannot accomplish them without your help. By reaching out, as you do every day, by reaching out to those in need in your communities, you also create leagues where we have the, the realization that we must turn to each other and say, I am scared for you. Are you safe? We must be able to do that. Do not think, as I once did, that because of the color of my skin or where I live or my junior league membership, that any of us are immune from incest or alcoholism or family violence. I want to quickly share a story with you. Um, it's about, I, I heard this about a year ago, uh, and I thought it was so great and so appropriate for what you all do every day. It's about a, a story about a man named Charles Plum. Um, he was a U.S. Navy pilot during, World, during the Vietnam War, and after 75 combat missions, his plane was actually destroyed by a surface-to-air missile. He parachuted in, into enemy hands, he was captured, and he was imprisoned, actually, at the Hanoi Hilton for over six years. Now, he survived, and he goes around now lecturing on his experience. Well, one day, Plum and his wife were actually at dinner the night before a lecture that he was about to give, and another man at the next table came up to him, and he says, well, you're Charles Plum. And he said, yeah. And he said, you flew off the uh, uh, USS Kitty Hawk. And he said, yeah. And he goes, you were shot down on this certain date, so on and so forth. And Charles Plum turned to him and says, you know, how do you know? How do you know who I am? And that man looked him in the eye, in the face with tears in his eyes and said, because I'm the one that packed your parachute. I'm the one that packed your parachute. Charles Plum just was aghast. He shook this man's hand and he said, you know, I, I guess it worked. If it hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. Well, Plum tells, Charles Plum tells uh, that night he couldn't go to sleep. He couldn't sleep for thinking about this. Uh, he thought about this sailor who he must have passed on the ship of that, of that carrier, must have passed him day in and day out and never looked his way, never said thank you, never for a minute would, would even glance over to a mere sailor when here he was, this famous fighter pilot. He said, I kept wondering what he must have looked like in that Navy uniform, a, a white hat and bell-bottom pants. He thought about the hours and hours and hours he must have, that man must have spent in the bowels of that ship, folding yards yards and yards and billows of silk, holding in his hands each day the fate of someone he didn't even know. I'm going to ask you today, ladies, who, who has packed your parachute? Who has packed your parachute, has made it possible to be where you are today? Is it a parent? Is it a, a friend? Is it a co-worker? Is it a teacher? I would like to know, I would like for you to think who has packed your parachute. Charles Plum actually pointed out that he need, needed many parachutes before his order ordeal was over. He certainly needed the physical parachute to land. He needed the mental parachute. He said he needed a spiritual parachute and an emotional parachute, and he called upon all of these supports before he was freed. You know, I think so often we all go through our lives without stopping to say thank you to someone or, or I appreciate you or you're special to me. So often we forget to say hello or please or thanks for what you've done. Thank you for packing my parachute. Today I would ask you not only who has packed your parachute, but whose parachute have you packed? Whose parachutes do you and your league members pack every single day who may not ever see you standing there, who may not ever recognize what you've done or realize that you hold the fate of their lives in your hands? But that's not why you do it. You don't do it because you're waiting for them to say thank you. You do it because you said you would. You do it because that's what your league stands for. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And we do it because we've been put on this earth for something greater than ourselves. Nelson Mandela once said that safety and security doesn't just happen. 
They are the result of, co of collective consensus and public investment. He said that we owe our children, the most valuable citizens in any society, a life free of fear and a life free of violence. Ladies, you and your leagues are that public investment. You must be tireless in your efforts. There are too many bad things happening in our communities. There are too many children who are hurt, and there are too many senior citizens who are alone. Former President George Herbert Walker Bush once said, points of light are the soul of America. They are ordinary people who reach beyond themselves to those lives in need, giving hope and opportunity and friendship and care. I have had that opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, because of the Junior League. Each of you have the opportunity to do just that, and you become a point of light as you reach beyond yourself and you give care and you give hope, and it is th with that very hope that I will continue in my, re uh, in my efforts and my resolve to create a community, to help create a nation that believes that peace on earth begins at home. I want to thank the Dallas League for nominating me. I am so honored. I am so touched by your confidence in, in what we do together. I want to thank you all for this recognition, this most prestigious award. It is truly an honor. And by the way, don't give up on your girls on the back row. You never know, OK? Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Watch this thing behind us. Okay, no, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Can I stay here? Yep, stay right here.